What interests me is the images that get created and the beliefs that follow the image. Let's see if I can tie this to an example. I was leading a retreat with, uh, with Dharma Zen Center in Los Angeles this past weekend. And I was discussing Kungans with one of the older students. And those of you who've been around for a while, you're gonna recognize this. There are a number of Kungans where there's a monk, the monk says something, and then we have these questions that follow. And one of the questions is, is sometimes, this monk made a mistake. Where is the monk's mistake? And then when I'm working with students working on this Kungan, and I'll include myself for most, most of my life, the first thing we do is we bite the hook and we say, oh, we're being asked where his mistake was, so there must be a mistake here. The language that we hear forms the way our minds respond. And what I'm calling biting the hook is the way Karen brings up reincarnation and suddenly reincarnation is present. And then our minds take over and our beliefs and our ideas and our opinions start to play out. So there's a line, another line in our morning bell chant, which says, mind makes everything. How we hold it, what our idea is, what our belief is, shapes the world that we exist in. When we're walking in, the, in our neighborhood and we see a tree, we think the tree is out there and we could even walk to the tree and touch it. So in our regular way of thinking, the tree is outside our minds. But when you really take it in, we cannot experience that tree outside of those six root consciousnesses that Karen talked about. We see the tree and the tree reflects back through our eyes into our consciousness. So is the tree outside or inside? And then we prove to ourselves that the tree is outside our minds by walking up to it and touching it. But as Karen said, that touch is one of the six root consciousnesses of mind. So we feel something I'm holding these beads in this hand, I feel them. So I believe they're outside my body. But in actuality, my experience of that feeling is inside my mind. Perhaps to say inside my mind is also incorrect. Is there an inside and an outside to mind? Does it have dimension? Is it big? Is it little? Is it wide? Is it narrow? Those of us who've been around this school for a while, and again, working with Kungans, we know the very basic Kungan. Buddha is mind. Mind is Buddha. 10 years later, that particular Zen master became very well known with mind is Buddha. That was his tagline. Everybody made up ideas. What does that mean, mind is Buddha? So 10 years later, he said, no mind, no Buddha. So mind is Buddha, no mind, no Buddha. Are they really different? Are they the same? We don't know. That not knowing opens us up. When we really hold the contradiction and they don't fit together, there's a space. And that's the space of Zen. Sometimes we call it before thinking mind. Sometimes we think, call it not knowing mind. Sometimes it's the mind that's jolted 
out of its complacency. So in our practice, we have this old Chinese phrase. It's ha! Did you get it? Even for a little second, did your mind stop? What is this? So use your life to stop your mind. Pay attention and let each moment surprise you. I guarantee you there's much more to the moment that you're in than what you're acknowledging and taking in. Staying asleep means following your beliefs, following your ideas, and really believing that it's true. Awe, not knowing, waking up means leaving room for what you don't know. And in that space, awakening can happen.